to be as brief as possible with this intro is the fact that I wanted us to look at the life of Joseph as a leader and you know that we're all leaders right he led the children of Israel but we're all leaders we're all put in this world to lead others regardless of what God has called you to do it is a it is God planting you wherever you are, to be a child of God and to lead others in what it means to be a child of God. Even if there are people there that are unbelievers. It, it's about that. I mean, I'm, I, my, my, let's see, what's a, Mike Motes, I'll use you, Mike, since you got my favorite shirt on today. Um, Mike makes a living by doing small engine repair. That's what he does. He's got his own business. But reality, God has use that as a way to supplement his income. But really, God has him doing what he's doing because he's there to let his light shine. My wife is a school teacher. That's the way God supplements her income. But the reality of it is, her call, her purpose is to be a light, to be a leader among children, parents, and other teachers, to be that Christ-like person. That's all of our calling. And what we're doing is we're looking back at the life of Joshua and we're seeing that. We're trying to learn these lessons from Joshua that would help us to experience something that I think God wants for us every moment of every day. He wants us to realize and experience His presence. You are the temple of the Most High God. So with His Spirit living within you, then you, you need to be aware that every day you can experience God. He's in you. If you're not experiencing I want you to, because I believe God wants you to do that every moment of every day. And then with that experience, then you get to encounter His power. And through His power at work in your life, you experience the blessings of God. Now, I know we got some gifts in the house, so I'm just going to put this out here. something God showed me. Uh, I'm not making a doctrine out of this. It's just something that God showed me through the study of, of, of Joshua. And I think, it's, it's, I think I'm, it is God is as we look at Joshua, really when we look at the Old Testament, it's, it's a narrative of the history of Israel. Man, all the way from the beginning, shouldn't say just Israel, because it's the beginning, but all the way up to how, how, how the Christ, how Jesus the Messiah was brought into this world. But as we look at the physical narrative, those physical things that we are reading about, in particular like in the book of Joshua, are spiritual realities for us today. Meaning this, if you were, didn't grow up in church and you heard the story of, of the Israelites going into 
the promised land, you would say, how does that apply to me today? We can look at how God worked, and we have, but how does that apply to me? I'm not trying to knock down wall cities. I don't have a river in front of me that I can't cross at flood stage. You see? So how does that apply to us today as children of God? And the reality of it is, is everything we see physically is a spiritual reality for us today. You, you may not have a river that's flooded that you physically are trying to cross, but there's definitely obstacles in your life that are preventing you from experiencing the presence, the power, and the blessings of God. There are walled cities in your life. There are strongholds, as the New Testament calls them, of where the enemy is setting up and he is preventing you. I'm not going to go back and preach that message. That was one of the best messages of this series, if you've been paying attention, where he's trying to prevent you from, from entering into the blessings, the presence, and the promises of God. And what we have to do is we have to, we have to hear from God, and then he's going to give us the instructions of how we can now be a part of bringing down that stronghold. That's a spiritual reality today. I mean, I hope you don't have any walled cities you're trying to break down, right? In, in a physical realm. And so that's the whole purpose of this. And what I've observed as a pastor is we can occasionally, occasionally we'll experience the presence of God. Whether you know it or not, the presence of God was here this morning and still is here this morning. But I could sense some of y'all weren't engaging because of whatever reason. That's why I was being led of the Spirit. I felt like you need to be encouraged right there. Listen, don't let the circumstance, situation, how you feel, keep you from entering into to, to the presence of God, see. Because it's in the presence is where the joy and the peace come from. It's there, but you don't realize it till you get into His presence. But so often what we don't understand is that we just experience it from occasion, but, but God wants us to be able to live continuously in that promised land. When the Israelites crossed the Jordan, conquered the enemies... The land became theirs, just like God had said it would be. And we believe that the promises of God are, we say that, but yet, are we living in those promises? Are we realizing the promises? They are yes and amen. And so often we just, we, we, we don't, we, we, we just assume that because we're not continuously living in the presence, the power, and the blessings of God, that's just the way God works. Now, Scripture is very clear that God wants us to enter the land of blessing spiritually in, the, in, in, in this reality of the New Testament, New Covenant. God wants to be active in our lives. Lamentations 3.22 says this, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Wow, what a dad. Because of His great love, we are not consumed. For His compassion, His love, it never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your your faithfulness. So every morning, God has new compassion. He has new love. He has new mercy. He has new grace for us, see, every morning. The fact is, God's blessings are not accidental. They're not, they just don't happen. They're not automatic, and they're not arbitrary. What we've learned from looking at Joshua, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get into this. I need you to grasp this, okay? As we looked at this, there are certain things that you and I can do that will position ourselves to experience God's work in our life. That's what this story is all about, right? That, 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 that's why this is about helping us understand how we can live at that next level in God. The reality of every day I'm living with the power of God in my life. Every day I'm living with the presence of God in life. Every day I'm, listening, I'm living within the blessings of God. Every day. And learning how to not to just visit there like on vacation, but to live there. Now today, we're going to be looking at uh, at pursuing God, chasing God. There was a book out, God Chasers, many years ago. It was a great God about chasing after God. And I think it's safe to say that this one principle, maybe more than any of the others, has a big impact on what we experience when it, from God and when it comes to the things of God. And to get the picture of what it looks like, we're going to be looking at a guy by the name of Caleb. How many of y'all remember Caleb in the story, uh, Joshua in the story? Okay, a few of y'all do. Yeah, y'all don't know Joshua. Well, good. This is going to be a good history lesson, and hopefully you'll glean some spiritual insight from it. All right? Look at okay. Now, Caleb is a man who's described several times within the Old Testament as a man who is wholehearted. Wholehearted. When we look at that, when we look at it within Mir Miriam's dictionary, wholehearted is, is defined this way, completely and sincerely devoted. Determined or enthusiastic. 
A person marked by complete earnest commitment, free from all reservation or hesitation. So let me ask you all a question this morning. In your walk with God, are you sincerely devoted and determined and enthusiastic? That's not to beat you up. That's just a question. Are you there? Were you glad this morning when the alarm went up? I can't wait to get into the house of God. Woo, come on, baby. Get the kids. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Was that you this morning? Obviously, I'm not saying you had to be that animated. But was you saying, man, I'd really like to just sleep in today. It'd be a good day to stay at home. How about this? There again, this is not to be derogatory. I'm not here to beat you up. But when the worship and the praise began, we said, were you enthusiastic about singing praise unto God? Were you excited? Was you raising your hand? Was you lifting your heart in adoration? Regardless of the song, regardless of the style, regardless of the wording, regardless of what's going on around you, where you said, yes, Lord, I praise you. Thank you for being my champion. How was you like? Where's that enthusiasm? Where's that excitement? Where's that commitment? Are you sold out about the Word of God? Are you in the Word of God? Do you read it? Do you let it be a part of who you are? Do you live by it? Even when, whoo, if I do that, that's gonna, it's not going to work in my benefit, but the Bible says do this, see? Yeah, see? Do you, do you wake up every morning determined to live out your life for His glory? See, does He have all of you? And is all of you about all of Him? It's time of evaluation today, see. Caleb is one of the original spies, if you don't know who he is, that Moses sent into the promised land when they came um, out of Egypt to Mount Sinai to travel through. They came to the Jordan River, and Moses sent in 12 spies, two of which were Joshua, who's one of the main characters in the book of Joshua. And then there's Caleb, who's kind of quiet in this story, but yet very, 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 very important. And what we find is that uh, in our text, you're going to find that for 40 years, this he, uh, uh, he was pursuing after God, his heart. In fact, six times in the Bible, it says that he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Over in Numbers 14, 24, listen how he is described. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. See, follow me wholeheartedly actually in the Hebrew is one word, and it really means to pursue. Because Caleb pursued God. Because Caleb closed the gap. Because to, he, he was determined to get closer to God in his life. Now, we all have played this game. How many of y'all been playing tag? Remember playing tag as a kid? Come on. Put your hands up. I want to make sure, unless you didn't wear deodorant. Okay, if you wore deodorant, good. Right. How many of y'all remember playing tag? Okay, I'm going to get a little anima- animated here, okay? You have the person who is it. All right, that represents us today. Now, I don't want you to take this literal example, uh, this story or this analogy example literally because it's not that God is running from us, but God is on the move. Did you know that God's on the move? God is always on the move, right? And you got to go where God moves. He's trying to move you where he wants to go. I'm going to preach a minute now because I think I've, I've not quite got you. God is always on the move. God is the God of the move. He's always moving. He's not, and he wants us to be following him. He, and it's not that he's hiding from us. So you are it, and he's the one that you have to tag. And the whole purpose of being it is you got to close the gap on the one who's running. you got to close the gap on the one who, who's on the move. And that's what that word means. It literally means closing the gap, getting as close as, as to the person you're trying to tag so that you can physically touch him. That's what this word means in the Hebrew. That's what it means to literally close the gap. What this is telling us about Caleb is that he is what? He pursued God. He went after God. He wanted to shorten that distance between himself and God. What does it mean to be wholehearted? It means you're saying, God, I want to be as close to you as I possibly can get. I want to be as close to you as, and listen, you can be close to God. You can be close to God. I want to be as close as I can. I don't want anything to come between me and you, God. I want to close that gap. I want to remove as much as I can that's between me and you because I want to be as close to you as I possibly can. With everything I am, with everything I have, with every fiber of my being, I'm going to pursue with everything within me. Pursuing all of you so that I can be as close to you as I possibly can. That's what it means to be wholehearted. Going after God. Now when you do that, 
it makes a massive difference in regards to what you experience of God working in your life. I'm going to say it again. When you do that, that makes a massive difference of how God can work in your life. If God's on the move and you should be closing the gap, He is leading. He is guiding. He is moving things out of the way for you. That's why it's important that you try to get as close. You don't want to fall behind Him. Wholeheartedness. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Now, I'll speak a little bit more on this later, but I want you to notice by that scripture, uh, as I pursue God, as I serve the Lord, as I close the gap, it has an effect on those who follow me. There's a wake, and it affects those who are following me, it affects my wife. The closer I get, the more I become like God. It affects her. It affects my kids. One day it will affect my grandkids. That's the way this works. This is, if you'll stay with me, this is a very powerful message to close out this series. You'll just grab a hold of this idea of following hard after God, pursuing Him. In other words, when we are talking about wholeheartedly following the Lord, there is an issue of legacy. Remember I preached that on Mother's Day. It's like I said, this isn't necessarily pointed at dads, but can I stop here for a minute and say, Dad, how you live your life, how you pursue God, determines the legacy of what you leave your children, as we'll see here in just a moment. There's a legacy that's involved. It is you and I setting up the table, not only for God to work in our lives, but in the lives of people around us and those who come after us. We see that Caleb is described as wholehearted in Numbers chapter 32. I believe these scriptures will be on the board. I have you in Joshua. Stay there. We're getting there. This is what it says. This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnina to look over the land. This is Moses talking here. Or they're talking about before they crossed over or before he sent the spies. And they, they went up to the valley uh, of Eshkol and viewed the land and they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. The Lord's anger was aroused that day, and he swore this oath. This is what God said. But they have not followed me wholeheartedly. Not one of those who were 20 years or older or more when they came out of Egypt will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God had a promise for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. God's promises are yes and amen, but there's a promise. You say, well, God's not a promise keeper. There are situations, there are things that we have to do to encounter the promises of God. Be, one of them is to be wholehearted. Not one except Caleb, son of uh, Jephana, and the, Ken, uh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Notice there is a, a direct cause and effect in this text. A cause and effect because the people did not follow God wholeheartedly. They did not get the promised land that God had promised them. Makes you think about your theology a little bit, doesn't it? God's promises are yes and amen. But there are conditions based on His promises. But Joshua and Caleb, they did. And because they did, they're the only two of that generation that entered the promised land of God. Whole. Heartedness, see. Again, in Deuteronomy, we see the word wholehearted used to describe Caleb and the results, the cause and effect. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 35, it says, no, uh, no one from this evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give your ancestors, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh. He will see it. Excuse me, Jephunneh. Jephunneh. I'll get it out there. He will see it, and I will give him and his... Dis- Lord, loose these tongues. And his descendants the land he has set... His feet on. Why? Because he pursued God. He chased God. He closed the gap that God. He was full on for God, right? Because he cared about God more than he cared about anything else in his life. Because he followed the Lord. Why? He followed him wholeheartedly. Caleb gets the land, and so does his descendants. It's never about you. It's always about those who come after you. Now, to Joshua 14. I just got to show you here. I needed to show you how he is described. This is a powerful word description of of a man. It it is. So Joshua chapter 14, verse 8. 
I, however, follow the Lord by my God wholeheartedly. This, this is Caleb speaking. He says, I have pursued God. I have closed the gap. I have chased after him. This is who I am. This is what I do. And it's, what, it's what's most important in my life. That's what Caleb is saying right there, wholehearted. So on the day Moses swore to me, the land on which you, your feet you've walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever. How long? Forever. See, what you and I do today determines those things. Because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Verse 14. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since. Because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Caleb followed God with every ounce of his being. He chased after God. He pursued God. He closed the gap. And because he did, God blessed him. God blessed his wholeheartedness. There are great blessings that follow the person who closes the gap, the person who pursues God, who's wholehearted in their relationship and their approach to God. So let me ask you a question. Are you wholeheartedly serving the Lord today? I think we started that way. We kind of gave some parameters, whether you like them or not. But that's the question I have to present to you today. Are you pursuing God, living sensitively to Him and His plan, His will for you? Is that who you are today? Is that, are you more concerned about what God wants or what you want? Do you live with a, with a concern of, of putting anything between you and the Lord? Or, or do you live with that? I, I, I don't want to just say me because I'm not perfect by any means, but I, I do. I wake up, I don't want anything between me and the Lord. I don't want anything that's going to hamper our relationship. I don't want anything, sin, whatever, attitude, whatever. At times it happens, and that's when I have to repent and get it right. I don't want anything. Are you doing everything within your ability to pursue God and live as close to Him as you possibly can? See. Now, one of the ways we can evaluate that, if you're unsure or you feel safe about that either way, like I said, it's not for me to judge you or to evaluate you. I'm just presenting the information to you. But one way we can evaluate wholeheartedness is by looking at the opposite of wholeheartedness, which is, many would think the opposite of wholeheartedness is no heart. But in reality, according to the Bible, that's not it. According to the Bible, the opposite of wholeheartedness is half-heartedness. It's half-heartedness. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 this, this, is what, this is what Jesus said. He said, I know, he's talking to the church of Laodicea. He says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I know I, you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. If there's an advantage of being cold, is this. If you're cold, you know that you're not where you need to be with God. True? When you're cold, I want you to think about this. When you're cold, you know that you're not right with God. I mean, you know either I don't believe in God or I don't care about God. I'm not worried about following Him. I know He exists. What have you? All right? That's one of the benefits of knowing that you're, that you're cold. Therefore, you're basically not fooling yourself is the point I'm trying to make here. But there's a problem with being lukewarm because the problem with being lukewarm is being half-hearted is that you just, you're just enough devoted to God to deceive the thinking that you're where you need to be with God. You, you, you're devoted just enough to think, oh, I'm okay with God. We, we get this idea that we have arrived when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about hold hardness devotion to God where you are living in His presence, His power, and His blessings. See, that's something you have to decide. If all you want to go do is go to heaven, that's fine. That's, that's it. That's fine. But if you really want to experience the presence of God in this life and be in His will and go where He wants you to go and be able to, to live in the promises that are yes and amen, this is, this is how you do it. And you know, you know what? Can I be honest with you? You know this to be true. Because when you're half-heartedly serving God and suddenly crisis comes up, what do you do? You, you, man, you narrow that gap. God! Oh, God! You slide into the altar like a second base, like you're stealing second base. Oh, God! I need... And I'm not saying that's the wrong response. I'm just trying to point out to you, because you know this, Suddenly you want to be in his house. Suddenly you're on your knees praying. 
Suddenly you're looking into his word for direction. You're calling the pastor or someone that you know is a spiritual person. I need you to pray for me. We see this all the time in church. I see it all the time in church. Because why? These people are half-heartedly following God. They, 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 they're, they, they're devoted to him in the sense that, okay, I know him. I've accepted him as Lord and Savior. But they're not pursuing God. They're not closing the gap. And because they're not, when God moves, they don't move with him. And when they don't move with him, now they're out of the will of God. Or the obstacles come that prevent them from being in the will of God. Or those, those Jordan rivers you need to cross over, you can't cross. Or, or the walled cities that need to come down aren't going to come down. Or when you need to remove some stuff, remember the circumcision message. When there's stuff that God requires you to re- remove to renew that covenant with him, you don't do it. And the results are you're half-hearted. I'm not questioning your salvation. There's just no fire in you. There's no spiritual real oomph in you. Why? Because you're not pursuing God. You're half-hearted. You're not whole-hearted. See, I could end this message right now, but I'm not going to. But I want you to hang on to that thought. I think, I, I think the Lord, the Scripture message has your attention right now. But I, I want to continue. Four signs of half-heartedness real quick. Four quick signs. And this is not exhaustive. But one is you're more concerned with what others think than you are about what God thinks. If you're more worried about what others think than what God thinks, then you might, you might be half-hearted. See? Do people like me? Do they respect me? Do they accept me? What do they think? Oh, if, if they knew I was a tongue talker. What would they think? Oh, if they knew our church was that way, right? Oh, if they knew I went to that church, right? I know some of y'all are closet Pentecostals. <laughs> or if you said no at a temptation or something because the, the buddies say, hey, let's go do this. And you say, no. What would they think about me? Our ladies, same way with the ladies, see? See, more concerned with what others think. Next thing is you rationalize sin. Yeah, you rationalize sin. It's not sin, it's a mistake. Oh, it wasn't lust, I was just looking, see. So-and-so does it. Everybody else has done it. See, yeah. It's no big deal, see. Oh, we say nobody's perfect, and by all means we know nobody is perfect that's very true but when that becomes the manner in which we justify our sinful actions or our complacency towards god our relationship with god something is wrong in our lives see something is wrong in our lives see the answer when we sin should not be nobody is perfect the answer when we sin should be repentance before god asking god for forgiveness and saying god is there somebody that i need to go to and ask to forgive me that's biblical, see. That's true repentance. And not to do that again. Repentance is turning from that, that action, that lifestyle, that way of thinking. Another sign is, uh, of half-heartedness is weak faith. You wish you could believe God for big things. Matter of fact, you need God to do big things in your life. You need Him to move in your life. But you can't muster up the faith to believe them because you're half-hearted. You're half-hearted, see. James 1, 6, 8 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should never expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded, useful, and use, unstable in all their ways, and all they do. That person is half-hearted. See, this is the problem with half-hearted commitment and devotion to the Lord. It leaves you wanting in the moment of your greatest need. Finally, when you're half-hearted, you find yourself looking at people who are walking in God's blessing and wondering, why them and not me? You might even resent them for having what God has promised. But with hold hardness, there's also some benefits. And I want to share two benefits before we close because these are very powerful. So I hope you're listening up. I hope you're taking notes. These are in our church app. But I want you to follow along with me. What I've found is one of the benefits is is that it builds your faith. When you're wholehearted chasing after God, it builds your faith. What I have come to find out is faith does not automatically grow. You know what automatically grows? Fear. You You don't have to do anything and fear is there and doubt. 
when that phone call, when that phone rings, you know, when you get that phone call, especially if you're a parent of adult, <laughs> adult children, you get that, or aging parents, either one, you get that call at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, say, oh, Lord, what's going on, right? It's not like everything is fine. It's like, oh, what's happened? The, the fear, the doubt starts coming in. See, that's, that's a reality. Those things don't have to be cultivated, but faith has to be cultivated. And more than any way, it's cultivated by pursuing after God. Closing the gap between you and the Lord. The closer you are to God, the easier it will be for you to believe for His power to be working in your life. The closer you are to God, the more you will know about God. The closer you are to God, the more you will hear God. The more you're closer to God, the more you will see God. The closer you are to God, the more you will follow God closely when He moves. See, not wondering where He's at, you'll know where He's at at all times. Listen, if God's telling me to move or do something, although that may bring anxiety into me that maybe I'm uncomfortable with, I can have the faith to know that I'm walking in obedience to him and he's going to take care of the results, see. Caleb made the decision to pursue God. Numbers 13. We're getting back to Joshua in just a minute. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. Listen, this is what the ten spies said. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Man, you're right, Moses. It flows with milk. Matter of fact, here's the fruit. Here's the evidence of it, right? But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak, which is giants there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Remember, the spiritual reality is, is this. Lord, I'm fighting a battle. There's an enemy over here at work. God, there's an enemy over here at school. God, I got an enemy right over here that's trying to divide the church. Lord, you see what's happening in my home. This is the enemy. Look at all these enemies. Oh, there's a stronghold right here, Lord. This is the reality of what we're talking about today. Then Caleb... Silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. We can certainly do it. Caleb didn't go along with the ten spies who said there was no way of taking land. He said there's no way they couldn't take the land. Let's go do it because God has said so. See, here's something everyone should, should give a thought to. You don't want to wait until you need great faith to have great faith. Don't wait until you need faith to build your faith. Amen? You can't build the faith that moves a mountain in a minute. Will God at times be gracious to you? Yes, God will. We know it rains on the just and the unjust. There are times that God will be gracious to you regardless. Will God bring people in your life to believe for things that you have a hard time believing for? Absolutely. That's what's important to have a, a godly mother and a godly father and be a part of a body of Christ. But better to build your faith before you need your faith. Better to have that. You know, I played yesterday in a little tournament yesterday at 100 plus degrees. I'm an idiot. All right. I was out there, and, and, and I mean, from 8 o'clock, by the way, congratulations, Josh, he plays second in the tournament, buddy, proud of you, amen, and I'm going to tell you something, I wouldn't have made it as far as I did physically if I hadn't been drinking water all week long, I had to build up my reservoir of hydration in my body so that I wouldn't die of heat stroke or I wouldn't start cramping up, I didn't have any of those issues. Same way with your faith. You can't wait till you need your faith to have your faith. You've got to build your faith before the crisis ever comes into your life, before the, the, the walled city, before the river, whatever it is that you're facing, the stronghold. Pursue God today. Walk close to God today. Live wholeheartedly for God today. When Caleb came back with his report of the land and said that the Israelites certainly could take the enemies of the land, that faith didn't come get built in that moment. He, that, that didn't happen in that moment. His faith in God had been built long before then. His faith did not give him the confidence, excuse me, his faith gave, uh, not only gave him a confidence in God, but a, certain regarding, a certainty regarding God's promises, what God had said. See, he had seen the same walled cities, he'd seen the same giants that they seen, but Caleb didn't look at what was physical. With his physical eyes, he looked at it with a spiritual eyes, with the understanding of faith of what God had said. And we know 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we do not walk by sight. 
We don't walk by what we can see. We walk by what? Faith. What we have read. What we believe about God. And let me tell you something. If you're not in the Word of God, then what you believe about God may not be accurate. You better be in the Word of God because it tells you exactly who God is and what His plans are. What His promises are. Now, He may use somebody like me from time to time, but even then you need to check the Scriptures. That's why I give you all these Scriptures. I don't come up here and give you my opinion. I give you the Scriptures and then I just, I just, just elaborate on the Scriptures. You need that. Some of y'all need this story right here in your life right now. You need to change your direction. You need to start running after God wholeheartedly. Narrow the gap between where you are, where God's at. Otherwise, you're going to miss his next turn. Not because he's trying to outrun you. It's just because you're not keeping pace with him. All right. Life is more than what you can see. Faith will determine what you see and how you see it. And if you lack faith, it's, only going, it's going to be impossible to see things like God does. And that's what we have to do. And that's the benefit of being wholehearted and pursuing God. It will change your eyesight. It changes your vision. What you see and how you see it. It changes the way you think. How you think about things of God. It changes how you talk. How you live your life. Everything will change. And it will line up with God as you, line, as you get closer to Him. Caleb was close to God and had great faith. Verse 7, I was 40 years old, Joshua 14, 7. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to what? My. What was his convictions based on? What God had said. He didn't have the word. You realize it. He didn't have this. Not the whole Bible. Definitely not the New Testament, you know. Yeah, a conviction is something you are convinced of, something you have faith in, something you believe to be absolute. That is conviction. Because Caleb was pursuing God, close to God, he had convictions, things he was convinced of, things he had faith in. In this case, he was convinced he had faith in regards to what the Lord had told him, told him in Israel. They would possess the land. Faith gives us conviction. I'm convinced by what God has told me in this word. I'm convinced. If God said it, I believe it. Every aspect of it. Every aspect of it. He said it, I believe it. Verse 8, But my fellow Israelites who went up with me, the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord with my God wholeheartedly. I pursued God. I chased after God. I closed the gap. I know what God said. I know what God has shown me. He says, I am closing the gap. Verse 9, so on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your, you, your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. You see the cause and effect here. Because he followed God, he would inherit the land. Not only him, but his children would inherit the land. The blessings of God are not accidental. All right? They're not incidental. They're not happenstance, see? They are not automatic. There's things that we have to do because he was wholehearted, because he pursued God, because he closed the gap between him and the God. Because of that, he received what God had already promised him 40 years prior. 40 years between the time God promised, about 40 years, probably a little longer as we'll find out. But basically, that's a long span. But he followed God. When he didn't get the promise, he didn't get disheartened. When they didn't enter in the promised land, he didn't get disheartened. Nothing says he got angry at the other uh, Israelites or, or angry at God or angry at Moses or angry at Joshua. Nothing, nothing implies that or indicates that. All it says is that we know that 40 to 45 years later, what happens? He enters into that promise God made him. Why? Because he, followed, he was wholehearted. Verse 10, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since that time. So 85 years, he's, that's how old he is. He said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. Woo! I hope when I'm 85 I can say that. Come on. Give me that strength, Lord. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. He didn't say I'm just as vigorous to sit in the easy chair, right? He said, no, I'm ready to go out and battle, man. I'm a warrior. Let's go, right? You yourself heard that the Anakites were there. Their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helped me. I will drive them out just as he said. Give me that hill country we're going to find out here in a minute. So he's 85 years young. 
And he says, give it to me. You promised it. I followed you. Even part of his, his testimony is, I have followed you wholehearted. When you follow God wholeheartedly, when you close that gap, when you're on fire for God, as we like to say, the pinnacle of God, when you do, you can go to God and say, Lord, you promised me. It's in your word. No weapon formed against me will prosper. You said that in your word. You can't, you can't say that if you're not wholeheartedly following God. That's a cause and effect. You said I won't go, I won't lack anything in my life, God. You said you'll meet my needs. That's a cause and effect. But if you're not following God wholeheartedly, He's not obligated. I'm not adding to. We stay here all day. I'll go through the scriptures to show you. It's a, it's a because. It's, it's because of this. This is what God can do for you. See. Caleb is not afraid because he, he's close to God. He's not afraid because he has faith in God. And this is, was not the time Caleb built his faith. It wasn't at this point he built his faith. He had already had that strong faith because he was pursuing God. And when it came time, he says, now we're in the promised land. You said I can have that land. And what's interesting, this is beside the count, beside it. You know why he wanted Hebron? You want to know why he wanted that land? He was part of the tribe of Judah, but there's a specific land that had the giants in it, though. But it wasn't because he wanted to take on giants. You're going to find out. I'm getting away from my notes. Just go with it. You're going to find out he's going to take on those three giants, and, and they're going to defeat him. They're going to drive him out. But you know why he wanted Hebron? Because that's where Abraham, the father of their faith, was buried. He wanted his ancestral land because it was important because he was a man of faith. He wanted where Abraham was buried. No, no, no. The man that God promised all this to us through, I want that land. I want that land. Secondly and finally, we'll, we'll try to close here in just a moment. Pursuing God, being wholehearted, blesses your future. We've kind of talked on this. Verse 13, then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Because and effect. You see that? You see the cause and effect right there. Because he was wholehearted, he inherited the land. He pursued, pursued God. Watch what God will do. If you pursue God, watch what God will do in your life that he hasn't been doing. Watch how he'll work in the people around you. This, not only did it affect Caleb, but it affected his family. It affected his children. Dad, I told you this wasn't a Father's Day message, but I want you to understand, Dad, when you are pursuing God wholeheartedly as the high priest of your home, you are over, as we're studying right now in 1 Corinthians, <laughs> this, this past week and this week to come, Dad, you are expected to be the spiritual leader of your home. You are. And when you pursue God, when you follow God wholeheartedly, not only are you being an example for your family, which is very, very important. I'm so glad that I, I have what I have today because I have a father who served God. Now, those blessings were automatic. I had to now line up with what God's plan were. I, I couldn't ride his skirt tails. I had to get my own relationship. You young people need to hear this, okay? Y'all under 30 especially. You can't live off the relationship your mom and dad has with God. you got to have your own relationship. But as my dad, I, I, I was in the wake of the blessings of God in my family because of what, how my dad lived as a wholehearted, sold out to God. Man, I'm telling you, we, we were blessed because of that. And now I'm in the wake of it. Now it's my turn. I'm going to tell you right now, I have set my boys up. I have lived unconditionally sold out to God so that they see that example. And if they follow in my footsteps, as I followed in my father's footsteps, they too will have the blessings of God in their life that will then go into my grandkids' lives. Knowing that the people around us when I was working in the secular world, I'm telling you, my bosses loved having me around because I was able to get work done. I was faithful. I showed up on time. I was accountable for everything they gave me to use. And I'm telling you, God blessed me because he wanted me. Why did he tell everybody, I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing to others. See my point? And they loved it. I've never had an employer that say, I'm so glad you're leaving. It's usually tears. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Are you absolutely positive? Why? Because God blessed me because I was wholehearted in my following of Him. That's not pride. I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. I'm not perfect. I have sinned. I do sin. I will sin. But my thing is, is when I do, and I'm aware of it, I make it right with God, and then the person who I've sinned against. 
I pursue Him. I live in fear of God. Oh, you're afraid of God? I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid of disappointing Him. I'm afraid when I get to heaven, I might not say, here, well done. I don't want to hear, well, you did all right. You did enough to get in. Okay, well, I see you, your, your name's written in my book. I don't have a whole lot of works done over here that you should have been doing. You know, I had good things laid out for you in advance to do, but you didn't follow me very closely because you didn't. You didn't do any of the stuff that I had laid out in advance for you. See Ephesians, if you're wondering. Laid out in advance for you. Before you was ever conceived in your mother's womb, God said, I'm going to give you life. And in that life, I've got these things laid out for you. Oh, if you will just pursue me. If you will just, oh, shorten the gap between me and you. I'm going to show you things you never dreamed about. You're going to do things you never thought you could do. Oh, I'm going to work in you, and I'm going to work through you. But you've got to get close to me. You've got to pursue me. I've got to be number one in your life. There can't be a number two. I've got to be the only thing in your life. And I'm going to tell you something. Dads, if you do that, you'll be the father and the husband your wife and children need. Mom, if you'll do that, you'll be the wife and the mother you need. If you're an employee, if you'll do that, your employer will love you. Amen. And if you're a business owner, those who work for you will appreciate you and work harder for you. If don't, fire them. Right? Just narrow that gap. Because why? It's going to bless your future. When you're pursuing God, whole life affects your future. Joshua, did I read that? No. Let me real quick. Verse 13. In accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion in Judah, that is Karath, Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak, which was the giants. From Hebron, Caleb drove out three Anakites. Anakites. Those are, those are the giants. Shisha, uh, Anaiman, and Talmadi, the sons of Anak. Woo! Thank you, Lord, for getting me through that. I practice those. I ain't going to lie to you. I think I got them right. Forgive me if I didn't. That's pretty amazing. He takes on three giants and drove them out. This would not have been possible had he not pursued God wholeheartedly. You don't have giants in your life as far as physical people fighting you. But you may have giants in the sense of powerful people fighting you. You definitely have a giant in the enemy who's fighting against you. Unless you're not following God wholeheartedly. The best billboard Satan can have is a half-hearted Christian. Because with your compromise in your life and your coolness towards the things of God, you're showing those who do not know the Lord that's what it means to be a Christian, and that's not. Everything in the Old Testament physically is to be a spiritual, to a great degree, as an absolute. Most things are to be a spiritual reality. Jesus says, I don't want you to have circumcision physically. I want your heart circumcised. I had a discussion with my son trying to figure out law and grace. Does that mean we don't obey the law of the Old Testament? Jesus said, they're all summed up in two things. Love God with all your heart, all your heart mind, soul, everything within you, and love your neighbor as yourself. So you have to ask yourself, your actions, your attitude, what you're doing, is that showing God's love and appreciation of what he's doing and what he wants to do? Is how you're treating others, showing God how much you love him? See, it's about that devotion to God. So the question is, are you wholeheartedly committed to God? This is the third time I've asked this question in this message. And I'm not speaking about perfection. I am talking about direction. What is your motivation in life? For Caleb, it was to please the Lord. It was. What is it that drives you every day to get up out of the bed? There's days we need something to get out of the bed for. What is that? What is that? What is it that you really want in life? Does that line up with what God wants for you in your life? See, you want to be close to the Lord as you possibly can get? I hope that answer is yes. The fact remains, God will do in the wholehearted person's life what he will not do in the average Christian's life. I'm going to invite my praise team to come up and just start playing quietly behind me. We don't necessarily need vocals unless you guys want to. I'm going to say that again. God will do in the wholehearted person's life what he will not do in the average Christian's life. 
2 Chronicles 16, 9 says this, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose heart are fully committed to Him. See? God is looking for people who are fully committed, wholehearted to Him. Those who are seeking Him. It's almost as He's like, where's that person who loves me? Where's that person who's committed? Oh, there they are. Man, I want to strengthen you. Obviously, God knows that. That's the way the, the writer is trying to describe it in ways that we can understand it. But God is, is, is looking for those who are seeking Him, those who are fully committed to Him. Isaiah 30, 18 tells us that the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Do you know the, long, the Lord longs to be gracious to you? It says He rises to show compassion. He, he longs to be gracious. He wants to bless His people. He's looking for those who are seeking Him. Jeremiah 29, 13. Most of you all know this scripture. You will seek Me and find Me when you seek Me, seek me with your, your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. See, when you seek Him wholeheartedly, you will find Him. It's, that, it's as if when you're following after God with all your heart. He is screaming and waving. It's not that he's hiding. It's not that the old P game alright, which one is he under? He's always saying, hey, when you're following me, when you're seeking me with all your heart and you're following me, he's saying hey, this way there's trouble that way. That's not good for you. Come. Come follow me. I have blessings over here. I have a water that will refresh your soul over here. Come on watch out. Watch out, there's a cactus there It just wants to stumble, cause you to fall. It wants to hurt you. Come on, follow me. When you seek Him with all your heart, He wants to bestow His blessings. He wants to direct your life. He wants you to have the blessings, the power, His presence in your life. One more scripture. Then I'm going to pray over you and let you guys go. Your dad's going to eat that steak dinner today. Your kids are going to cook for you. 2 Chronicles 31, 21. Yeah, I know. I got some of y'all awake when I said steak. 2 Chronicles 31, 21. Talking about Hezekiah and everything that he did. Excuse me. Everything he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands. I'll say it again. Everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple, that's in serving God, worshiping God, working, okay, and in obedience to the law, how God, what God commanded him to do, and the commands, the other things that God, that, as God led him to do, see, and all that, right? He sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, and so you know what? He prospered. He was successful. Why was he? Because in everything and how he served the God, how he served God. See, as he walked in obedience to God. See, and as God directed him, he walked in obedience too. Because of that, he did it with all of his heart. Not just when it was convenient. Not when, not when it suited his schedule. Not when it suited his likes and dislikes. When he did all of that wholeheartedly, he was blessed. He prospered. Everything was successful. That's powerful. That's a powerful cause and effect, isn't it? As a result, because he did, he prospered. Because he was wholehearted towards God, he was prosperous. He was very successful. There's tremendous blessings in being wholehearted towards God. May we all live our lives that way. May we all live our lives that way. There's a cause and effect. There is. In the natural world, there's every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. The Bible tells us that as we sow, so shall we reap. In God's Bible, in His Word, in the Holy Bible, we look at it the wrong way. This is a book of how to. Not the do's and don'ts, how to. I don't want to debate the finer things about Christianity. Jesus is the ticket to heaven. But you know what? Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. Now. You want to live in the blessings of God? If you're lacking blessings, this isn't necessarily, I'm not saying this is absolute. Check. Am I, if you're not, am I wholeheartedly serving God? 
Ask God. If God wants to bless you and you're not feeling blessed, if you're not experiencing His power, if you're not experiencing His joy, you're not experiencing His peace, come on. Come on. Then ask Him why. But then be open for Him to tell you. Because He wants to. He wants to. He wants to give you a future. And a great future because why? He created you out of love. Got a great future. Amen. Yeah. He, he has a great future. Not to harm you, but bless you, right? Give you hope and a future. A future now and a future later. And as you serve God wholeheartedly, your faith will grow and you'll leave a wake behind you that your children. You know what? I left this out. Can I just share something? This is good for Father's Day. Caleb's story continues over in the book of Judges. And over there, he gets his land. And he marries off one of his daughters. And part of that was he gave her and her husband a piece of property, a piece of land. And she came back to him. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I'm not adding to it. You can go back and look at it. It's in Joshua, uh, Judges chapter 1. She comes back to says, Daddy, can you give me a little bit more? Because that's what kids do, especially little girls, don't they? They got Daddy right there. You know what daddy does? He says, sure, Suge. I'm going to give you more. And he gave her more land, and it's some of the best land in Hebron. It's springs. Springs is representative of life. Why? Why could he do that? Because he had it to give. Why did he have it to give? Because he followed God wholeheartedly. And because he did, God blessed him, cause and effect. And he in turn, his children were blessed. Now, what she does with it was up to her. I've, I've lived, my dad lived his life for me. So I could, I, I'm in the wake of his blessing. But now, because of my life with God, I'm being blessed by God. You're my blessing. You're part of my blessing. And my kids right now are. I remind Trevor all the time. That air conditioning is because God's blessed me. Quit wasting it, right? But one day, just like Alex is on his own and married. Now they have to make a decision how they live for God. I can't. I, Say with my youngest son. See, but they've had the example, good and bad, lived before them. Now, you have to choose. But as for me and my house, even if it's just me and my wife, we will serve the Lord. I knew I could bring it back around somehow. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 I don't want to belabor. I know it's Father's Day. But you know what? I'm not worried about what you think because I'm wholeheartedly serving God today. But I would be remiss if I didn't have a prayer, time of prayer. And this is how I want to close, if you don't mind. If you, if you will just give me a moment, I will, I will let you all go and eat and celebrate Dad. And if your dad's still not alive, celebrate him because you're here because of him. But if you're special, if you're privileged, I shouldn't say special, if you're privileged enough to still have your dad, you better love on him. Love one.